my slides are up on deconf.org, so if you want to follow up with the slides on your own laptop uh, or on the stream, then do that. Um, I've been using D for about six years now, and very early on in my D career, I started trying around with DLLs, and I noticed that DLL support is very limited. Um, so I wrote a bug report, um, but unfortunately, it never got implemented properly. So I wrote a, a DIP, a language improvement proposal, um, which generated some fuss, but it didn't uh, lead to an implementation either. Um, so I thought for myself, how hard can this be? Uh, I never worked on compilers before, but it's software after all, so it must be doable somehow. And uh, I started hacking at it. And um, I finally ended up with a solution that works, and I'm going to present today what led me there and what problems I discovered on the way. So um, the goal for me from the start on was to build the runtime and Phobos into a DLL so it can be shared across multiple executables. Um, the DLLs should be as close as possible to static libraries, so it shouldn't matter if I link against a library that is built dynamically or statically, it should just work and the user shouldn't have to care if he's actually linking against a dynamic or a static version. And it should be easy to use and there should be no surprises, uh, ideally. So um, first, if you want to implement something like this, you do, what do you do? You look at what does C and C++ do. Uh, in C and C++, as you can see here, um, we have, uh, does, this is with the Microsoft compiler, we have DeckelSpec DLL export and DeckelSpec DLL import. And what you usually do, you wrap them up in some macro and depending on a, a conditional, if that DLL export is defined, which is only defined if you actually build your DLL, then the DLL API macro means export, otherwise it means import. And that is, that's how it's usually done in C and C++. But in D, we only have the export protection level. And that's it. So we no, don't have any import. And now let's see why, why that is a problem. Um, please ignore the cyclic dependencies here. Uh, it's just to make the code shorter. Um, otherwise, it would be a lot more code to display the same problem. Um, you basically have two libraries, uh, A and B, and you have an executable. And the header file for the libraries you can see in the top left. And then while compiling library A, you can see that func A is exported and func B is imported. So that the C++ compiler knows this one I must export, this one I must import. The same for library B, just the other way around. And then when compiling the executable, the compiler knows, the C++ compiler knows I have to import both of them. However, in D, the situation is different. No matter what you do in D, um, compiling the library A, compiling library B, or compi compiling the executable, the D compiler always sees this. It always sees a module with an export and a function. And even the implementation is in there if you don't use DEI files. So the compiler has no idea if it should be exporting or importing that particular function. Um, and that indeed is a problem. So um, how do first so solve this problem one by one? Um, first thing is functions. How does C++ do it? So this is a small example. You see we have some DLL um, which has a header file with a function in it and a C file with implementation. And then we have an executable that actually calls that function. Um, what happens here is, is this. So um, first let me explain this a bit. We have the uh, object file of the executable where you can see the compiled function that calls the DLL function. Then we have the DLL lib, which is, which is the import library for our DLL. The import library is generated by the linker, and it's basically uh, a library you link against instead of linking against the DLL. And that import library then takes care uh, for you of loading the DLL and doing the right stuff with the symbols. That import library contains an indirection lookup table, or also sometimes called import table, which contains all the uh, indirection entries, which are usually start with the, the imp uh, prefix. So um, everyone who has been working on Windows once or in a while with DLLs has most likely seen one or two linker errors with, with import in front of it. And then on the right side, we have the object file in our DLL, which basically generated the actual function. And then um, you can see that this is separated into the ex executable and the DLL. What happens here is that the function uh, in the XA object file calls 
does not directly call the DLL function. It uh, first dereferences the entry in the interaction lookup table and then calls whatever it got from that dereference. So we have one additional level of indirection here when calling a function that resides inside a DLL. But the problem here is if you look at a, a assembly for call DLL fun function, you see that it's different from what you, you would usually do. Normally, if you call a function, you should do just call function, and then you're done. But in this case, it's dereferencing that import symbol. So the code generation here is different if we're calling a function that resides inside a DLL versus a function that resides uh, in the same executable. And that's a problem because, indeed, we don't have import. So we don't know if the function is, resides in the same executable or if it resides in a DLL. So we have to do something different. So um, then let's just try around and remove the decal spec DLL import in the import case. That means um, in the case where we build a DLL, it still exports. But in the case where we don't build, uh, where we build the executable, it won't import. And now let's see what happens. And, that, and what happens is this. Um, the import library has one additional nice feature. It generates so-called trampolines which basically they have the same name as the function in the DLL, but they only have a single instruction inside of them, which basically does a jump to the address pointed by in the import table. So as you can hear, see here now, we now have two indirections. First, the call goes into the trampoline. The trampoline dereferences the indirection lookup table and then jumps into the DLL where the final code is executed. The nice thing here is, as you can see, we are now back to the usual calling a function, it just calls the function. It doesn't know that the function actually resides within a DLL, it just works. Um, so and that, that basically solves our calling a DLL function problem in D, because we can just use this in D and uh, don't have to know that a function is actually imported. Um, but functions is not everything, unfortunately. There are also, uh, there's also data we want to access, for example, global variables as the easiest example. And if you do that in C or C++, it looks something like this. We have a variable inside our DLL, and it's declared extern um, in our header file, and then we access it in, in our executable. And this looks then like this. Um, as you can see, it's, it's similar to the first case of a function call. Instead of a call, however, we do a mouth to access the data, so it first dereferences the entry in the import table, and then reads the actual data inside the DLL. So we have one indirection here. But again, this is a problem for, for D, because this is not how you would usually access a data symbol. Um, it's the same problem as with the function call. So let's see if we can use the same solution for it. If you do that, if you just remove the DLL import from the header file, however, this happens. So it's unfortunately not that easy for data symbols. So we need some, some other solution. Um, what we want is if we have no DLLs that are involved in our uh, linking or um, compiling process, we should directly access the symbol and we should not get any uh, penalty. Um, if the sim symbol resides in a different DLL, we have to go through the import table to find out the real address of the symbol. And if the symbol resides in the same binary, um, we should always directly access it. Um, that's, that's the ideal case. For case one, uh, I introduced a new switch for the compiler, which is use shared. You can think of use shared a bit like uh, fpick on Linux. It's basically tele, uh, enabling a slower code generation for the purpose of making DLLs work. And you should only, and you basically have to pass use shared when you compile your main executable. You don't have to pass it when you compile your DLLs. Um, and this is needed because otherwise, uh, if we don't have this flag, we always have to go the pessimistic path, and all statically linked executables on uh, Windows would get a performance penalty, which is something you don't really want. Um, and if we don't, if we know that we have some DLLs involved, we always go through the import symbol, no matter what. Um, but the problem here is that the import symbol is only generated for data symbols that are actually inside a DLL. Nobody generates them if the symbol is not inside another DLL, but in the same 
binary. And for this case, I consider this code. I hope it's big enough. Um, we have two modules. Let's assume we compile them with single module compilation. So we pa pass each of them to the compiler one by one. So we don't pass them at the same time. We pa pass one, get one object file, pass the other, get the other object file. And then we link them together into the same DLL. How should the compiler know that these two object files go into the same DLL and don't end up in different DLLs? Um, and because of that, we always have to go to the through the import symbol. But for the case that they end up in the same um, object file or in the, in the same executable, we manually generate these import symbols. So for every variable there is, I manually, the compiler manually generates that import symbol directly next to it. So it's there in case it's accessed in this uh, multi, in this single object file compilation case. This is obviously a, a small speed of performance impact. So if you pass all your modules at the same time to the compiler, you will get better code than if you do single module, a single object file compilation. Because if you pass all of them at the same time, the compiler can actually figure out uh, that it does compile both of these modules into the same binary and can do the optimization to skip the uh, import symbol. So then you think you're done because we have data, we have functions, um, how hard, that, that should be it. But then somebody comes along and does something like this. Taking the address of a variable and using it in an initializer, which works fine if you have a fully statically linked build because then the linker can figure out the address and fill it in for you. But if you have a dynamically linked library, the address is not known at link time. It's, it's done by the operating system loader. So you have to somehow resolve that address at runtime. And first, uh, first thing that comes to mind, do we even need this? Can't we simply say, oh, we don't disallow, we disallow this feature, you can't take the address of a data symbol that's, that's exported because it might be inside a DLL. But unfortunately, you can't do this because it's used all over the place in, in uh, D. Um, type infos, we tables, exception handling tables, and module infos all have uh, references to different data symbols. And so, and these are residing in different DLLs, so we can't just declare this case illegal. We, we have to fix it somehow. So, um, the way I settled for is uh, before we start up the runtime, we do a patch step, which basically uh, resolves all this. And, and how this works is, instead of taking the address of A, I take the address of the import symbol. So um, I basically have, it points into the import table. And then before the runtime starts up, I dereference that thing once. And so oh, that's a mistake there. Uh, on the left, it should also say address of A. And put it into the same thing again. Um, and that way, um, the operating system loader will fin fill in the address of the DLL symbol for me, and then I can access it. But there are more problems to that approach. There are more evil things you can do. Um, you can add an additional offset to the pointer that resides inside the DLL. Consider the following case. We have some array uh, symbol on um, a global one that's exported, and now we access the pointer of that and add, um, basically compute the address of the uh, third element in the array. And that's even worse because now we have to add an offset on top of the symbol we just resolved. And we can't add that offset on top of the import symbol, we have to add that offset during the patch up step. So, um, and this brings us to the final solution. Um, Again, uh, it, it takes the address of the um, import variable, and then it has a fix-up table, which basically is a list of all the addresses we have to patch, including the offset we have to apply after we patch them. And this fix-up table is generated by the compiler. Uh, it's put into a section, so it's easily uh, locatable by the runtime. And then uh, before the runtime startup, we actually iterate over the fix-up table and just dereference the pointer and add the, the offset on top of it. I know this, this line looks horrible, uh, the one line 17 here, uh, but if, if you think about it a bit, uh, it actually makes sense to have that many stars in there. <laughs> 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 so, 
So uh, let's, let's go over this once more graphically. So this is what we start up with on disk. Um, we have address of A which points into our import table. Then next comes along the operating system loader and fills in uh, the import variables address for us, which basically points to the first element in the array. Next, the runtime is going to start up, and we are going to dereference the import, uh, import table entry. So we now end up with address of A pointing to the first entry in, in the array. And now finally, as a last step, we apply the offset and get the address of the uh, um, element we actually were looking for. And that solves that problem then. Um, but this, uh, this table approach with having this table that uh, references all addresses that need to be fixed up has a problem because now we are pulling unused symbols in. Everything that needs patching is now pulled into the binary even though it might not be used elsewhere. And this was a problem that I had that I didn't find a solution quite a while for um, until I discovered that it, there are associated comdats. In the Microsoft Linker supports associated comdats, which basically is a comdat that's, that is associated with another symbol. So that comdat will only be pulled into uh, the final binary if the symbol it's associated with is used by someone else. So I basically make all these fix-up entries in the fix-up table associated comdats, and then it solves the problem of pulling in unused symbols. But then I hit the next problem. Suddenly, uh, the size of the fix-up table went through the sky, and there were lots of padding zeros in there, and I couldn't figure out why. And at this point, I want to say a big thanks to Rainer Schütze, who helped me figure this out. Where are you? Over there. So what happens there is Microsoft has an incremental linker feature in their linker, and what the linker does, it just adds paddings of zeros before and after the comdat sections, so it can rewrite the content without rearranging the data inside the file. And if you turn off incremental linking, all these padding zeros go away, and you have the nice compact uh, table again. Um, and then, um, as an optimization in 64-bit, I used relative offsets, so um, you store the relative offset from the entry in the fix-up table to the actual address you want to patch instead of storing the address you want to patch, which is half the size of the fix-up table. So I can store uh, the relative address in 32-bit and the offset in 32-bit, which brings me to a total size of 64-bit. What C++ does for this fix-up case, they actually generate a runtime initializer. and They generate code for it. And... Um, that is 14 bytes in size, so the code generated to do the fix-up, so uh, we are a lot better than what C++ does in, in uh, terms of binary size. Um, and now comes the part where all the people that are using Linux can listen again, because that's uh, relevant for you as well. <laughs> so just of, out of curiosity, who's using Windows here? Uh, or D on Windows? Oh, that's, that's more than I thought. Maybe 25%, something like that. Um, everything, what, what should be exported? Which symbols should we actually export from our DLL? And if you look at a language specification or a language reference like it's called on your homepage, there's this single sentence. Export means that any code outside the executable can access the member. Export is analogous to exporting definitions from a DLL. That's it. There's all there is in the spec. Um, but it's, it's not that easy. Um, first things first. Do you see an export here? There is no export. Uh, no member in here is exported. But there are still symbols we need to export here because that's a template. And the template gets instantiated on the user side. So if you have a DLL, which this module is in, and the, then the user instantiates the template, the template will be instantiated into the executable of the user. And that assert here will actually ca call a function generated by the compiler, which is uh, every module, ha module has its own assert function. And that assert will call that. Um, and if we don't export that module assert function, we get an unresolved uh, symbol error. And there are all kinds of other uh, compiler internal symbols we have to export. For example, the module info, the module unit test function, the module array bounds check function. Um, so what I'm currently doing, because you can't put export in front of module, that's illegal in, in, in the grammar. So what I'm currently doing is I just 
if the module is part of a DLL, I always export the compile internal symbols, no matter what, because I can't know if they are ever used or not. Um, the next thing is classes. If you think about exporting a class, um, you see here we have some class and it's, it's ex uh, declared export. So what should be exported here? Obviously, um, what a user would want to do is derive from that class and maybe override some of the functions or use some of the, um, for example, the protected function here. So if, if the user overrides the class, he should be able to call bar because bar is protected. But uh, the, the spec says only stuff that's declared export should be exported. So in this case, I wouldn't export bar and the user would not be able to call it Otherwise, if you would call it, you would get an unresolved external symbol. So what I'm doing is um, I'm basically making export transitive. If you make the class or another aggregate type like struct export, it means that all this, the members inside that are either public or protected will automatically be exported too. So in this case, it will export foo and bar because they are public and protected. It won't export foo impl because that's private. Private stuff is, is never accessible and so it does never need to be exported. And it will uh, also export the struct data because it's protected and, and because the struct data is exported, it will export the data func because it's public again. So you can see that that export kind of needs to be transitive for, for this stuff to work. And then again, we have some hidden compiler internal symbols we need to export, always export. That's, for example, the virtual function table and the type info for the class. Otherwise, you're going to get, again, linker errors. Um, and now we come to a fun feature of the D language, which is Voldemort types. So I have a function, and I export it from my DLL. And in turn, it has some Voldemort type, and then it returns it. If I, do this, if I just do whatever the spec says, I again have the problem, the Voldemort type won't be exported because there's no export in front of it. And I can't put export there because the grammar doesn't allow me to do it. So again, here is export as counting as transitive. If you mark a function as export, all types and, and other stuff that is defined inside of it must be export too. So uh, the, the struct Voldemort automatically gets exported here because the function gets exported. And, and that, that, that's kind of stuff that you realize after, like, I noticed this case pretty late because I never had that case, and then I made Phobos compile into a DLL and suddenly someone did this, so, um, yeah. Um, now comes a part where you would think that that's not necessary or that it doesn't make sense. So if you see something like this, you have a template and it's export, and you think, how does this make sense? because how can I export a template? The template is instantiated on the user side anyway. But DMD has a logic that um, it does not instantiate templates if it knows that the template already has been instantiated. So what happens actually, if, if you rewrite that um, top part to the bottom part, it makes more sense. You have a template, and if it gets instantiated, the instantiation should be exported because DMD assumes that if it's instantiated somewhere, it can reuse that instantiation. So I have to export that instantiation from my DLL, otherwise the user again is going to get uh, unresolved external symbol errors. Unless he's going to pass the um, instantiate all flag to the compiler, which is a hack more or less, so yeah. And now we come to the main issue. Um, that basically keeps me from doing a pull request against the compiler so far. Um, consider this case. You have some template function inside your DLL, and it has an um, uh, implementation detail, which is just a regular function. It's not a template. And this code would uh, compile perfectly fine with, with, cur with the current DMD and if you link statically, because the template can just call uh, the private function. It's in the same binary. Everything will work. But the function write impl is private, so we won't export it. If the template now gets instantiated, it will be instantiated on the user side, so on the wrong side of our DLL boundary. It's now trying to call the private function, which is not exported, so you get an external symbol error. Um, and if you think about it, if you now make write impl export, which basically what, what the, the spec demands, 
It means that now the user of your library can call your implementation detail functions. This case already occurs twice in object D, which is basically the most fundamental D file you can have, and I counted it over 50 times in Phobos, and in Phobos it, it happens quite frequently that entire classes that are currently private suddenly become public because you have to make them export, and export is even more public than public, um, so that, that users would be able to call into implementation detail functions of Phobos. And, and that's, I think that's something we don't want. The last time I made this argument, I got a contra-argument onto this, which was basically like this. All function types that must be accessible across a DLL boundary should be public because you can access them through get proc address anyway. Get proc address, for everyone who doesn't know, is, is a low-level function of the Windows API where you can just give it a string and it gives you the address of the symbol as a void pointer, so it's as unsafe as it gets. You have to cast the void pointer afterwards. And if you don't know what the type actually is behind uh, the symbol, you can make horrible mistakes. And, and if, if you want this argument to hold true, I have a contra-contra argument for you, which is basically all members of Struct's classes should be public because they can be accessed through pointer arithmetic anyway. <laughs> so, um, um, and that's why I think we should absolutely make export an attribute. Because if export is an attribute instead of a protection level, you can actually put export in front of a private function and it will work. Um, I did analyze how much code breakage this would cause because we don't want to break anyone's code. And I did not actually find a single project on GitHub that uses export because uh, it's horrible broken at the moment. Um, I even encountered uh, a bug once. I don't know if it's fixed already, but I believe not that Windows-specific code connected to export is executed in the DMD compiler when compiling on Linux or Mac OS X. That means if you have lots of export in your code and you try to compile, you basically break the project for Mac and Linux. Because the link... Sorry? That's... That's still true. Very good. <laughs> but my pull request will fix this. So. Um, not even Visual D, which is the most important project on, on Windows, uses export because it doesn't work. Um, I, I talked to Reiner and he said he uses uh, definition files where he manually lists the symbols and then passes the definition file to the linker because he can't use export. And so making it an attribute would all would actually only occur very little breakage because nobody's using it anyway. And in the cases where somebody is already using it, it's very rare that it would break because public is the default visibility. So if we re replace export by, by an attribute, the function would still be public unless there is something like private colon on top of it. Um, yeah, and as I said before, um, this is the main issue that's currently keeping me from doing a pull request because my fear is if I do this pull request now and we make export the export protection level live, then we start to have code that actually uses it. And if we then uh, realize afterwards that it, it's a mistake, that it's a protection level, we would break lots of code. Um, and also, uh, in, in my eyes, these visibility concerns are... Um, separate things. So you have module-level visibility, which is basically a compile time construct. The compiler checks at compile time if you can access a protected private or a public function. And, um, and shared library visibility, which is basically a runtime construct for the operating system, is something completely different. It's not checked by the compiler, it's checked uh, at, at runtime by the operating system. So the operating system checks that all the symbols you need to uh, import are actually there. So we shouldn't mix them up into the same language concept. Yeah. So now a few unsolved issues, uh, which I hope to either resolve on this conference or, or afterwards. Um, there's still some discussion needed around this. Um, first thing is unit testing. I previously mentioned um, that I have bad test coverage on, on Phobos, and this is the particular reason. The way unit tests work in, in D is you have some function, for example, some algorithm, and then you put the unit test right next to it. But what that means is that the unit test is ultimately going to end up in the same object file and therefore the same binary as the, the algorithm to be tested. 
But if you want to test your algorithm across a DLL boundary, this is a big problem because then you want the unit test to be on one side of the DLL boundary, so for example in the executable, and your algorithm you want to be inside a DLL. And um, because of this, I can't unit test Phobos with, with what, is, what is there. What could we do about it? We could either extract the unit tests, um, which is a problem because unit tests may, may access private symbols in, in some cases to be better, uh, better able to test stuff. And obviously, if you would extract such a unit test, it would fail. Or we could write completely new ones, which basically test all the Phobos across a DLL boundary, which is tons of work. So there's an, I can't really see an ideal solution at the moment. Um, the next unsolved issue um, is template deduplication. We have this little program here. We have some, some templates uh, with a variable inside it. And then we have, so the, temp, the module A is going to be built into a shared library. The module B is also going to be built into a shared library. And the module C is going to be built into our executable. And we link them all together. Um, so module B just prints that variable. And the uh, main executable also prints that variable. Well, first it assigns fives to it, and then it prints it. Does anyone, what, what should this program print? What would you expect it to print? Anyone, yes? Yeah, it, it should print five two times because there's one print inside the one shared library and one in the main executable. But it's going to print zero first and then five because what happens here is um, Windows is actually going to, in, uh, the compiler is going to instantiate the template twice, and Windows does not have a built-in deduplication for symbols in shared libraries. So the template will actually exist twice, and therefore uh, it will print f uh, zero once and five the second time. If you think about a singleton, this would be really a problem, because if you have some singleton template, and it suddenly gets instantiated three times, and you have three instances laying around, uh, that's not how that should work. On Linux, this is not a problem because Linux has one global lookup table for shared libraries and deduplicates the symbols automatically. So what would happen on, on Linux is it would recognize that the symbol already exists in a different shared library and reuse that. And then the entire problem goes away. We, uh, I think there is a way to do this on Windows as well, but we would have to do it ourselves, so basically in the runtime. Um, so, uh, but it should be discussed if we actually want this, uh, make it easier for the user, or if we want to show the whole ugliness of, of Windows shared libraries uh, to the user. But that's most likely going to uh, lead to a lot of hard to trace down bugs. Because in most cases, it won't be that easily visible. The next problem is thread local storage. That's one uh, thing I skipped so far. What happens if you export a thread local storage variable and then access it in, in your executable? So module A is again built into a shared library. Module B is our executable, and we access the, the value of the thread local storage variable here. What will happen uh, now is that you'll get a linker error because the symbol is, is not exported. But you can't actually access uh, thread local storage that easily. You would have to, um, for example, implement an accessor function that's called instead of accessing the variable so that it accesses the correct thread local storage index. Because each shared library has its own thread local storage index on Windows, and the main executable usually has thread local storage index zero. But the last time I made this um, proposal, that's what that was in dip uh, 43, um, there was a veto against it because you shouldn't be using thread local storage variables in your um, shared library interface. That was the argument back then. Um, but this already happens in, in Phobos and D runtime a couple of times. Uh, you can work around it easily by, by writing that accessor function yourself, but uh, um, it's, it's not ideal and uh, it should be discussed if you want to fix this or if you want to leave it as is. Um, the next thing that comes up once I do the pull request is what do we want to distribute here? If we distribute shared libraries or DLLs on Windows, Phobos and D-Runtime built into a, a DLL, it has to link against the actual version of the C runtime. You don't have that problem if you ship a static library because the static library does not link against anything. So the user can pick what C runtime to link against. But if you build a, a DLL, you have to tell the, the linker what C runtime to use. So um, 
and there are maybe there are many people around that you are using different versions of Visual Studio. So what we would have to do in the worst case is ship eight versions of Phobos because uh, you want to have one uh, debug version that links against the debug C runtime, and you want a release version which links against the release C runtime, and then we have these four common Visual Studio versions, or or even 2012 if you want to add it, then it's 10 binaries you had, would you would have to ship. And that, that's 100 megabytes of size if you include the debug symbols. And that would double this, the, the size of the, the DMD uh, distribution zip. So um, we have to decide something there. You could say we only support 2015 because it's free anyway, or something like that. So um, as a conclusion, uh, this, this doing this pull request is a huge uphill battle for me at the moment because when I started this, uh, DMD was still on the C++ front end. So the first thing that hit me hard after I managed to get it working was the transition from C++ to D. When I finally merged across that, uh, I noticed that somebody completely refactored DTC, which is basically used to generate uh, static initializers. And I made lots of uh, modifications in that file because of all the module info and type info stuff that's having references to symbols in a DLL. So I had to completely redo all of DTC because Git uh, completely failed at merging it. Um, then uh, it's hard to keep up with changes in D-Runtime and Phobos with, with the varying amounts of time I have. And recently, we added support for Visual Studio 2015, which is a problem because Microsoft decided to completely uh, redo or reorganize their C-Runtime. So the C runtimes of 2013 and below are very different from the one for, of 2015. Um, so you have to do special stuff in order to support them both. And, and that's what I'm currently still missing. Um, but at the current state, it's already fully functional. You can build Phobos and D runtime into a DLL. You can use it. Um, and if you, um, if you get lucky and I got all the export statement right, you don't get an unresolved external symbol. But what's missing is, for example, all the work inside Phobos marking all the symbols as, as export. And, and I would love the community to help me there. I, I see Walter has a question. Yeah, Benjamin, I've uh, chased the Microsoft compatibility with multiple versions for years and years and years. And uh, the problem is, it's just not possible. The only thing to do is support the latest version. OK. And if somebody wants to, uh, you know, fork and support later versions and share that, that's fine. But officially, only the latest versions. Just forget about the other ones. OK. Because currently, we, we support all of them. Um, Rainer made some special effort, in, so we can still link against all, all C runtimes. It's, it's just a soul-sucking, resource-sucking problem to try to support all those things. Good. Just, just the latest. Forget about the rest. Simplify your life, <laughs> make it easier. Yeah, also, you know, you and I have argued about that export thing before, and I think you made a pretty compelling case. So, you know, you know what you're doing, let's move forward with it, get it done. Very good. Okay. So, um, it's up here, all the GitHub addresses. Um, for everyone who wants to try it out. Uh, I would, however, still recommend using Visual Studio 2013 and below at the moment. Um, but it's, it's fully working. You can build your DLLs. You can try them out. Um, if you find some unresolved external symbol errors, give me, give me an email or try to fix them yourself. Would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Because as I said, it's, it's a, a huge amount of work to cover all of Phobos and make, make everything that's in there correctly exported. So, um, are there any questions so far? Unfortunately, I have three. Um, OK. So first of all, you mentioned the case where you have a template function using a private function and how that's a problem. Yes. But C++ also has template functions. So why did, don't they have the same problem? Because export in C++ is an attribute. Fair enough. OK. Moving on swiftly. Um, unit tests. Uh, the module info stuff, I know how that gets generated in the code. How does that work with traits get unit test? Sorry, come again. Traits get unit test? Because then I think that might generate the code on the client, but I'm not actually sure. Traits get unit test? Yep. OK, I, I've never heard of that so far. I know a guy who wrote a library that uses it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just try it out and let me know. Uh, as far as I know, traits get unit test works completely at compile time. So it's kind of completely irrelevant. It just like goes through 
semantic anal uh, analyzed models and get the symbols for unit test as like function symbols. Okay. So it bypasses all the ABI problems. So, so what you're basically saying is we could write an in-library solution that would pull the unit test into the executable. Yes. So, so that it's executed across a shared library. Yes. Boundary. But you still have the problem that if your unit test accesses a private symbol, it won't link. Yeah, I don't know how that would work. That's also why I was asking. Um, and, and thirdly, I'm, I'm well aware why somebody would use a DLL, but what problem are you trying to solve that really needs this? So what problem are you trying, trying to, to solve that really needs DLLs instead of statically linking? Well, um, the DLL, asking for DLL support did come up quite a many times on, on the f uh, forums. And uh, I think even two years ago, Walter wrote some uh, forum post, we, we need DLL support, someone please do it. Um, and I personally like to use DLLs for, um, it makes your, if you have multiple subsystems in your program and you put them each in, into its own DLL, it has the advantage that your interfaces get a lot cleaner because you have to pay more attention to what part of your subsystem is actually available to other subsystems because you can easily see it with, with export. And another thing I actually want this for is I want to basically do the same that the um, guys from uh, Remedy have been done. So uh, Manu and um, even. Um, I want to have D as a scripting language. I want to have runtime code reloading. Um, my plan is that you have uh, basically only a small executable, and then you ha can uh, throw at it a D file or multiple D files, and it will recompile them, reload the DLLs, serialize all the data, and so you have even quicker turnaround times because you don't have to restart the process every time. In right, the games thanks. industry, it's, it's actually a big problem if you have to restart. So in the games industry, when you compile, the first thing that, that hits on your turnaround times is compile times, obviously. But the next thing is the process startup times. You load up lots of stuff from disk, for example, into GPU memory, and that takes quite some time. So um, the time you need for compiling and getting to a spot in, for example, the level of the game that you actually want to test is, is, is really big. So if you don't need to restart the process, all this, uh, this entire turnaround would get a lot shorter, and that's basically my... my Final goal at some point. Um, yeah. All right, I have a couple more comments. My comments about supporting the latest version applies to everything else as far as developer tools go. Like if you've got an interface with a uh, G++, only worry about the latest G++. Don't worry about the old ones. If you've got an interface to Clang, only worry about the latest one. Um, and also about DLLs on Windows, you know, if it's a resource problem, do the 64-bit DLLs and forget about the 32-bit ones. And the this actually works already with both 32 and 64-bit, but only if you target a Microsoft linker, because Optlink is unfortunately not capable of outputting uh, in the, the correct import symbols for data symbols. So Optlink does not have any notion of a data symbol, so it always outputs a uh, trampoline for a function, so it always does jump to the real thing, and, and, um, and because of that, I'm currently not supporting Optlink. Uh, but if that would be built into Optlink, it would be trivial to support it as well. Okay, um, I also kind of feel if you're using global variables in, across DLL boundaries, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you should be using accessor functions. Now, we, we, we may be stuck with that in some cases, but in general, you know, if you're designing something to be a, in a DLL, use function interfaces, not um, things and that gets rid of the TLS problem and stuff like that. Just just use functions to do it. Uh, with the unit test. Okay. Yeah. I, you guys have a special case. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with that is if if you say you have to use functions, then um, it's no longer the same as a static library. My my goal always is. It doesn't matter if you build my library into a static or a dynamic one, it should work the same. And if I use a, a global variable on my static library and I can't use it on, on the dynamic one, then I suddenly have a difference there. And, well, and you shouldn't be using global variables in your static programs uh, either. Tell that to, <laughs> yeah. Remember, tell global variables. Uh, tell that to the runtime and Phobos. Mutable global variables, all, you know, repeat, they're the spawn of Satan, and you should not use them in your code as much as possible. And, yep. you know, even Erno is now a function access. <laughs> access it. 
Um, you talked about having unit tests in your executable, executing code or testing code in a DLL. Yes. I mean, I just gotta like, forget about that. Unit tests in the DLL, you build a unit test build of the DLL, and when you call the DLL or you, the initialization function, it runs its unit tests. I don't, I don't see much of a point for having, trying to test your DLL from, with unit tests from outside. <laughs> Because yeah. otherwise, if you don't do that, you don't notice if you miss an uh, export statement. Or like, if, if you forget to make the, the, uh, some of the needed functions export, you won't notice if the UD test is inside the same binary. And, and what we ultimately want for Phobos is that Phobos want, uh, works the same way if it's built into a dynamic and a shared li uh, or a static library, the same as it's currently on Linux. Um, but um, if you have to unit test that differently, so if we have to test that differently for Phobos, someone would have to go in and rewrite all the tests for, for all of the exposed Phobos functions or... Well, the unit tests in Phobos are designed to test the internals of the Phobos functions, not really their uh, API. And you can just write a few other unit tests to check to see that the export exists yeah. and leave it at that. And I think that would resolve that problem. Good. Um, I forgot to mention where the Linux part comes in. Um, at some point, uh, it, the plan is to actually make export also used on Linux, because currently what Linux does, it just marks all the symbols as being um, exported from the shared library. But instead, what we want to do ideally at some point is that we only export those symbols that are actually marked with export, making um, the symbol table smaller for the operating system during startup and, and having other advantages too. And then basically all the problems I, I uh, explained so far with export on Windows will also apply to Linux. Yeah, and, and that's it. Okay, uh, and, and that, one last question. Uh, do I understand correctly, and yeah, that also applies to Linux too, that implementing this will basically enable LTO optimization for stuff like automatic class finalization? Like, so oh. it, it would become possible to automatically like divertualize and finalize classes that are not exported, like when compiling DL at once, stuff like that. Is no, correct. the one optimization I um, mentioned is really only f fighting the problem of always going through the import symbol. So, so the op optimization I mentioned that that does that automatic detection, that is in the same uh, binary, only works for this one case. Uh, it won't allow us to um, divertualize function calls or, or anything like that. I was about to actually say something along uh, those lines. So for all the people who dozed off uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the meantime, because they're actually only using uh, Windows, um, one thing you can really get people within a D community is faster compile times and faster execution. So you mentioned already that there's faster execution if you have less symbols to export, uh, just because you can, um, you, have, you have less work to do during dynamic loading. What you can also do is, which is both the compile time and the runtime improvement, is you can do link time optimization actually, as uh, Dicebot mentioned, um, assuming that, so currently if you build a decompiler that's general, you have to assume that on Linux, you have to assume that some shared library comes along and uses the symbols from your main executable. So you can't, what you would ideally want to do is hide everything but the main and throw away the parts you don't need. So, uh, throw away all the templates that you instantiated but you actually ended up inlining or never using but you can't do so because somebody else uh, uh, could end up using them. And if we have a working expert system, we could have a flag that says, okay, actually um, trust the expert attributes that puts on there, and then you could do those optimizations. And actually, even for a simple hello world in Phobos, I found something like a 30% uh, uh, decrease in compile times and quite a decrease in executable sizes if you're allowed to do that optimization. So even for the people who are only concerned about Linux, getting this right is something that's interesting. I especially build my pull request so that it's trivial on Linux to enable export once, once this is pulled. So yeah. it should be, yeah, you're right. And one technical question is, uh, what's the issue with uh, TLS on Windows? Because I mean, you probably know how it works in Linux, right? With the underscore underscore TLS get editor uh, thing in a dynamic TLS model. Uh, do you just not have the linker allocations to actually resolve the offsets? Um, on Windows, what happens on Windows is that every binary, so every DLL and every executable has a TLS index. And, and what happens when you look up the address of an, 
of a TLS variable is it first goes, it's basically a global variable, TLS index, it first accesses that and then uses that to index into um, operating system table to get the correct TLS data section for the current thread on the current DLL. And then it computes the offset from there. But if you access the TLS symbol um, from, from the executable while it's inside a DLL, the executable will use its own TLS index and it won't know what TLS index the DLL has it's currently calling into. And then that basically means that you're going into this whole lookup process with the, to with the wrong TLS index and then you get a wrong address, obviously. And because there is no way to access the... So when you call a function, you don't know in which shared library it, it is. It could be anywhere. And because of that, there's no way to actually figure out the TLS index. So what you have to do instead is a funct calling a function inside um, replacing that global TLS variable with a function that basically returns you the address of the TLS variable and does that computation inside the DLL because inside the DLL you have access to the correct TLS index. Yeah, that's awesome. Good, so. Thank you.